Welcome to Talk Dizzy to Me, the show that brings you a comprehensive look into the complex field of dizziness. Now here are your hosts, vestibular physical therapist, Dr. Abby Ross and Dr. Danielle Tate. Welcome back everyone to Talk Dizzy to Me. I'm Dr. Abby Ross, vestibular physical therapist and neuroclinical specialist joined by Dr. Danny Tate, also a vestibular physical therapist. And today we have a second time appearance by our guest, the Dizzy Cook, Alicia Wolf. And we're going to dive into, well, the first time we dove into life pre-giving birth. Now we're gonna dive into life post-birth with a newborn baby George with her. Okay. And I'm hoping baby George makes a cameo for our YouTube followers today. Hopefully we get to see the cutie. But what's been going on? How has life changed? Give us a little rundown on maybe going into labor, labor itself, post-labor, whatever. Go for it. Oh gosh, um, how much time do we have today? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know when you posted initially about everything going on, this was, you were in Texas, this is when you had the big ice storm, you were faced with coming home with a newborn with no power. Yeah. And on top of that, your post about leading up to delivery um, was kind of heartbreaking at, this, at the same time, so scary, but at the same time, <laughs> had a little bit of humor to it as well, since everything came out on top. So. Walk yeah. us through what happened because, you know, living with a severe migraine and all the symptoms that you had, you know, with everything going on in hormones and the stress and being, you know, in labor, that's going to bring on some potential symptoms, right? Right. So <laughs> actually, I, you know, I have an amazing OB and I just highly recommend that people, you know, it's for any doctor, for your neurologist, for a any sort of vestibular disorder just to find a doctor you can connect with and relate to and that you feel like really cares about you. And that's kind of the relationship I've had with my OB for years now. And so one of the things that she told me towards the end of my pregnancy was just to, uh, that it was, they've done studies that women who envisioned their birth experience on like at every level tend to have less postpartum anxiety and depression afterwards and are able to accept different if they don't have their ideal birth situation happen that they're able to accept that better which i never thought that um i was like well if i need a c-section like that's not ideal but i guess there would be reasons for it so i just never really had much of a birth plan or didn't really care all that much about it until I got to that moment and I realized, oh, I actually do care. <laughs> but um, one of the things we did to prepare was to hire a doula, actually, and I would highly recommend that. They kind of t walk you through everything and tell you what to expect as far as the birth goes. And the other thing is to just not also really not have a birth plan, which I didn't, I had things I wanted on there, but I feel like even those things that I want, wanted on there, like set myself up for a little bit of disappointment. Like if you go into it, just totally open to everything and, and visualize like all the different scenarios that could happen. You think you end up being more accepting of your situation. And what had happened to me was I had my ideal birth, which was like a natural childbirth or what they call a natural childbirth. Really, any birth is natural because it's part of life, right? But, um, the traditional, you know, like vaginal delivery, that's what I had wanted. And I had envisioned, you know, my husband being there, my doula being there. And I would, I, I was open to getting an epidural as well. Um, one thing that scared me about the epidural is I've seen a lot of people with like CS death leaks in our groups, like vestibular groups. Um, and it can cause a lot of the same symptoms as vestibular disorders. So I was really nervous about that with the epidural. And I kind of discussed that when my anesthesiologist came in and just said, look, I have this vestibular disorder, like, can you work with me and everything? And I really lucked out that all my anesthesiologists were amazing a day. And so I would just, you know, continue to be an advocate for your health, even during labor, have someone there that can be an advocate for you, because 
things do get painful, <laughs> but I feel like you also get, because it's so painful, you get um, more demanding <laughs> and <laughs> bolder about what you want too. So I guess it's like a good thing there. But um, basically when you do IVF, which is what we did, they like to induce you at 39 weeks. So um, if you didn't come early, that's what we were gonna do. So my uh, my high risk doctor and everyone else like that agreed. I had some complications that where we needed to induce early, just other things that were a part of it. Um, I had a single umbilical artery as well as like a lot high fluid and just these little things that had me going to a high risk OB that we were monitoring for. And so um, that was another part of the induction process. So they brought me in the night before we started the induction. It, it kind of kicks off the labor. And then the next day, depending on how you're progressing, they can give you Pitocin or something to kind of speed the process up. So that's what we did the next day. Um, I also took the advice of like so many women uh, who, who had messaged me on Instagram. They just said, get the drugs. I got the drugs. <laughs> um, you know, it was it, a lot of people had said, like, now is not the time to you, you're just giving birth makes you a warrior. Like now is not the time to be like all brave about the pain. And that that was some of the greatest advice was like not to feel guilty about any of that stuff. So got the epidural and worked my, with my anesthesiologist about that. Everything was going really, really well until I started having like really intense pain even after the epidural. And so I kept turning it up. Um, they let you kind of control it a little bit and I kept turning up the pain meds and my OB came in. I had been in labor for about 12 hours at that point, active labor for about 12 hours at that point. And then it had been almost 24 hours since I'd been induced. And she came in and I wasn't progressing since the last time, since the few hours before that she had visited me. And with this, I had a hematoma that was kind of blocking um, the birth canal. So basically George couldn't get out. And wow, um, yeah. <laughs> and so they, he was like right there, like, you know, they could uh, like, even in some of my appointments, like she could kind of feel his head and everything. So he was like right there, he just couldn't get out. And so at that point, because of the large hematoma and everything, they were concerned about if that were to break and then I would bleed and and it could just turn into a messy situation where I, you know, you could potentially lose your uterus or, or even death, worst case scenario. So, you know, we had a conversation. She's like, you know, we can continue this, but it could be a really awful situation if you want to continue this way, or we can just go to a C-section. So she kind of let me discuss this with my husband and and the doula as well. And we just decided to go into a C-section, but it all kind of happened so quickly. And I was just overwhelmed. I was exhausted. You can't eat anything. So I was hungry and they were wheeling me into the operating room. And I, my husband had to clean up the labor and delivery room that we were going to move all our stuff. So he wasn't with me. And of course, COVID makes this really hard too, because you have to be tested before and there's only a certain amount of people you can let in. And by some miracle, they decided to let my doula in the operating room with us as well, which was super kind of them and amazing. So um, I had a little bit of support, but on my way to the operating room, there was no one and I was just surrounded by, they were wheeling me pretty quickly down the hall. and. I had a mask on. They make you kind of lay mask on while other people are in the room, which is super difficult. And <laughs> I've heard like some women just like say, screw it. I'm not going to do it. But um, while they were taking me between rooms, they wanted me to wear it. And so I got so sick, I ended up vomiting in my mask. But I was trying to tell them I was like my vertigo was kicking in. And I could feel my vestibular symptoms like totally increasing. And I think it was just a combination of all the stress plus being wheeled on this thing super fast plus anxiety. And it just kind of all hit me. 
the light above you quickly. Yes, the lights, everything like that. It was just like I, my body couldn't take it anymore. And I hadn't had a vertigo attack like that in, oh God, like since I first got sick, maybe. I mean, it was really bad. And I was vomiting on myself and crying and like my mask, like had it all coming back at me. It was just not the birth experience that I had. Not <laughs> ideal. I envisioned my worst birth experience. It was not even that. It was just like, <laughs> I was just going to say, I would bet money that in your visualizations, that is not one you imagined. No, it did not happen. And I think that like, I, they felt so awful. They were like the second they got in there, they gave me some oxygen and took my mask off. And, and I, I, think everyone felt like really, really terrible. So they tried to make, they played with my drugs a little bit to try to make me like as comfortable as possible. So that was when I started explaining, like I have this vestibular disorder and everything was just so rushed. I didn't really have a time to go through that with them initially, like when they were wheeling me back. And so I think they got a, a clear picture of it. On the way. They got a front row seat. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but um, overall, like, the C-section was super easy. I was just on, they were trying to control, control my vomiting and everything like that so much that I was so drugged up and I was still really dizzy. I didn't get that time to, like, hold George right away or to have skin to skin right away. Like, I, all I could do was really kind of hear what was going on and it felt like I was out of my body a little bit. but. Um, the good thing about the way I try to look at it now and be positive about it is like your husband never gets, especially during COVID, like I'm sure, you know, if, if, if you guys get pregnant or have, have babies throughout this, you'll like husbands aren't normally allowed at appointments. So like my husband couldn't attend any of our appointments or sonograms or anything to see him. And so he felt like kind of disconnected the whole journey. Whereas like you have this baby growing inside of you and you feel constantly connected. So my husband got to like really hold him and to be a part of all that while like the doula was there and she was kind of holding my hand and getting me to calm down. And I was really glad that he got that experience because even though I didn't right away, like it was something that he got to have after I had like the month of seeing him on the screen and, and feeling connected in that way. So that's kind of how I like try to look at it positively when everything else was going wrong. (laughs) But um, after that, you know, we, we got everything sorted. I eventually was able to do skin to skin. It was just a super emotional, like I finally got the strength to watch our videos the other day. And it was just so emotional seeing like myself break down essentially. And I'm sure part of that was all the drugs and just exhaustion and everything like that. But hanger. Yeah. Yeah. We just cried all together. And I was like, you know, this was like years of infertility. This was years of loss. This was years of me being scared because of my vestibular disorder to even have children. And like, it all kind of came to a head when you have like this baby in front of you. And it's it's just overwhelming. It's a surreal experience. And so I actually, I spent all the time we could in the hospital, we actually stayed an extra day, an extra night, um, which I'm glad I did. I didn't want to rush out there because um, the the doc, the nurses will actually take care of your baby a lot. They have like a whole nursery and you can kind of send him or her to get some sleep if you need to. So what was important for me to do to kind of recover from like such a trauma experience and then also from the vestibular issues was to just try to get as much rest as I could while he was taken care of in a safe place and so we took advantage of that um but we did try to get out of there before these ice storms hit Texas not realizing it was going to be as bad as it was 
we had no groceries. <laughs> I had asked my mom to place an order for us and she didn't. She didn't think it was going to be that bad. So my husband like placed a last minute order of whatever he could right before we got home. But he was doing it at like five o'clock in the morning while we were at the hospital. So we ended up with like the most random things we could get because <laughs> everyone had picked over the grocery stores. So oh, what was goodness. really good was I had done all this like meal prep to kind of sustain us over the next few weeks while we adjusted. And we ended up going through most of my meal prep like in that first week. But we only lost power for like an hour one day. Oh, good. It wasn't bad, but it was like, a lot of living in fear because of all of our friends were like losing power. We have a fireplace at our house. So we were just... It was an eventful first week of the new form. Oh, it sounds very eventful. It sounds like it's just been chaos from day one. But in in the weeks yeah. now, you know, following that, how have things been going? How are you feeling? How's baby George? How's life? Yeah. So life at first, I was like, what did I do? And I don't think enough women talk about this. I remember I posted on my Instagram and I was just like, ha like I feel like the worst mom ever. Um, like the first few days we got home, I think part of it was the stress from the, from the storm as well. But after going through all this infertility and everything, like I was having thoughts of just I just want to be away from my baby. Like I just want to drive somewhere. I just what did I do? Why can I feed my baby? Like, why does this hurt so bad? I mean, like no one talks about how hard breastfeeding is until you say something and everyone's like, oh gosh, yeah, I had this experience too. And, and I think just all my hormones and everything hit me at one time. And I just felt like the worst mom ever. And I got, I mean, over a hundred messages from just mom saying like, hang in there, like this is totally normal, like you're doing a great job. And it made me feel so much better and so supported because I just never expected it to be that hard. Like you go through, I thought vestibular migraine, like losing my ability to walk and, and drive was really difficult. And then this was like a whole new really difficult challenge. And so I kept telling myself, like, if I got through that, I can get through this. Like, this is a baby. Everyone does this. Not everyone lives with a vestibular disorder, but <laughs> but it, it's it's really, really difficult in the in the first week. And then you kind of learn each other and and we had a lot of breastfeeding issues. My my baby had a tongue tie and so we had to get that revised and work with IBCLCs and everything just to try to feed him. And I just kept doing what I did like with vestibular migraine, which was as things are thrown at you, you just find someone who can help you and, you know, go from person to person until things get better and find the people who can help you the most. And luckily we got a great team that supported me. I think I'm really good at picking out people now <laughs> or yeah, for like therapists and yeah because <laughs> it didn't take very long for us to find some good good uh lactation consultants and everything like that but um my overall you know it was really tough on me in the beginning because sleep is such a huge trigger for me or like lack of sleep is such a big trigger for me but um as I as over the weeks, it's gotten much better. And I've actually been trying. So another piece of advice that I can recommend to people is like, talk to your pediatrician about what you can take versus like your OB or your neurologist. Because what I found was my OB and my neurologist were super conservative on medications, whereas the pediatrician and like the children's hospital was much more confident in what they were telling you you could and couldn't take. So that was really helpful for me. I was actually ended up um, 
it, I, it was able to take a lot of the rescue medications that had worked for me in the past for vestibular migraine. And I didn't have to wait on breastfeeding for those at the dosage I was on or anything like that, which my neurologist had actually said I did. But after going through everything and checking with our pediatrician and everything, they were like, oh, no, it's fine. It's super common. You're OK. So I just highly recommend that people check with them because typically it's easier on you um, if you don't have to wait to to feed or anything like that. So the yeah. one new, oh, go ahead. I was going to say that's really good advice. And so far, I was just going to give a recap of the tips that you've provided. And one might be visualize, right? Visualize labor, the birth pre, during, <laughs> and post, I think. And also, if you can, have a discussion with the people with the healthcare providers that you may have never met before, right? These are all new nurses to you. Your OB, of course, you you know, but right. um, have a conversation about your vestibular dysfunction because in the case of an emergent situation where you are flying down the hall, they probably need to know what could potentially happen <laughs> with that visual stimulation and motion on wheels and stress and <laughs> right. breathe properly with the mask on. Um, so one, have that discussion or one, visualize Two, try to have that discussion at some point. Three, I think lining up the right people for help you had mentioned was so helpful for you. Four, I wanted to speak to the fact that we've said before how great and supportive the vestibular community is. So to hear that you had over a hundred messages in support, I think moms in general are supportive of other moms, yeah. but then you add that specialty of a vestibular dysfunction, which most of your followers can relate to. I think the, the amount of support provided from this group of people is just amazing. So keep it up to others, people who are listening. And then uh, lastly, I think having a little bit of a plan afterward, knowing that it's okay to have these emotions and you might even have a flare up of vestibular symptoms afterward that you have to deal with. You can't take care of another human being without taking care of yourself too. Exactly. Yes, that is such a good point. And that's what I kept reminding myself, like if I ever felt guilty about needing medication or whatever. And a lot of the medications that help with vestibular disorders can also help with anxiety and depression. And when I first got home, like I couldn't even eat. I had so much anxiety. My heart felt like it was racing all the time. And so my medication kind of did double duty, like helping with my head and also with that anxiety. So that was kind of a, a good thing to have. Um, and then one of the new things I'm also trying is the gamma core device. So Dr. Bay had used this, uh, there was a study done in UT Southwestern where they had used it for vertigo attacks and vestibular symptoms um, for vestibular migraine and they, they showed positive results. So it's something I wanted to kind of test out during this time since it's a um, non, you know, it was, you can use it while pregnant or breastfeeding or whatever. And so um, that's kind of been helpful as I've gotten head pain increase. Actually, it's supposed to help with vestibular symptoms, but it's actually helped a lot with head pain that I think I'm getting more of with hormonal changes as well as lack of sleep. So that's been something interesting that I've added that I'm kind of still testing out to see how it works. But it seems to be doing a pretty good job, especially with like nausea and stuff like that. Well, I think that's great to be, you know, that's another piece of advice to kind of be open to having a new plan or a new approach, because it yeah. sounds like, you know, a lot of those big triggers, lack of sleep, changes in hormones, um, increased stress, um, all yeah. of that are huge triggers for a lot of people for any type of migraine. And especially after birth, I'm mean, like, you've got a ton of anxiety because now you've got this newborn baby that, you know, especially being a first time mom, it's like, what do I do with this? How do I keep this alive? What do I you know if yeah. I'm going to break it? And um, 
you know, having that on top of now, not sleeping well, not eating well, you know, things are going to be very different in your treatment approach. So being open to right. different medications or non-medication type approaches is going to be super important and something that needs to be thought about and considered when going through that process, because it's not going to be just get back on your normal stuff and away you go. There is going to be a readjustment period again, which is frustrating right. for migraine patients. It, it totally is. I mean, I, I had gone into it with the ex expectation I would just rely on my old treatments. And I did to a, a point and I had discussed with my neurologist ahead of time when we had a plan. And then little things would pop up like, you know, the overwhelming anxiety or these headaches, which I had never experienced head pain really with my attacks before. So just keeping in touch with your private providers can help so much. And hopefully everyone has like a my chart system or something where they can email their doctors and just say, look, this is what's going on. This either is working for me or it isn't. What can you recommend? And then just running everything by like that they suggest by the pediatrician as well. Sometimes you can even get them to talk to each other. I just haven't had to deal with that because every everyone knows what I'm kind of taking ahead of time and they were all okay with it. But uh, sometimes you can get them to talk to each other and, and come up with a plan, which is helpful too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, another thing that you touched on that I think is really important, especially if food triggers are a problem for you symptom wise is to meal prep. That was yeah. much, not only for the ice storm, but just <laughs> the fact that you don't have as much time when you bring a newborn home. And anytime you do have, you probably want to be resting your eyes, not cooking. So yeah. that I think is a really good piece of advice. Meal prep, the things that you know don't trigger you so that you're prepped for when you have less time and less energy to do that. That's good. 100%. Like we actually bought like a cheap bucket freezer from Home Depot. And I am so glad that I had that and that I spent I know you're like so tired when you're pregnant. But I'm so glad that I just spent every weekend kind of filling a bag of something whether it was meatballs or pulled pork or, or a soup that I could do and just putting that away because it's helped us so much. Like I, this is part of my job and I can't find a lot of time to cook or I'll have to cook in sections. Like I can work on it for an hour and then I have to come back to it. And I just never expected to not have, you know, that kind of time. So now eight weeks into it, we're, I'm getting into sort of a groove and we're getting into a schedule, but initially it's just, really, really difficult. On top of that, I've had to cut out like dairy and soy too with the breastfeeding just to see if it's an issue for the baby. So one piece of advice a reader gave me that I did not want to hear was to meal prep stuff, <clears throat> some of the allergens that you would that you can normally eat. <laughs> And I was like, oh, I'll be fine. I eat cheese all the time. Like, baby's going to love cheese. And now that we're trying to figure out, like, different issues with breastfeeding and stuff like that and reflux, it's like, oh, gosh, I should have listened. So just have some of those meals on hand, you know, kind of research it a little bit and just have some of those healthy meals on hand that maybe don't have dairy or some of the top allergens because you just don't know how your baby's going to react to it. So you know, that's, oh, that's another thing. <laughs> what was the last one you said? What was what was it? Sorry. I missed the last part. I don't know if it cut out for me or what, but what was the last thing you said? Oh, just just make sure that you meal prep a few things that have, you know, that are free from some of the main allergens. They usually they usually tell you to cut out dairy. They, they I think that's like automatically the one thing the pediatricians all say just to see like if your baby has reflux or issues like that so I'd say just meal prep a few things without dairy um just just in case <laughs> yeah you know yeah. it's so it's so interesting I don't have children but uh 
you know, you don't think about these things. I was talking to Danny earlier saying, I don't know how moms do it. I don't understand how you take care of more than just yourself sometimes. <laughs> but I, I'm thinking about my nephew when he was little, he wouldn't eat anything. Getting him to eat was so problematic. And it turned out that it was because of allergies. Oh. And then once they figured it out. He eats everything now, you know, oh. except for his allergies. But yeah, um, it's so important to really test the waters. And it's just not something, at least not something that I think about because I'm not in that stage yet. But it's a good point. Yeah, I was really sad. I mean, I donated my broccoli cheese soup to another mom friend of mine who isn't having issues. So it went to good use. But, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's it's tough when, you know, you get used to making stuff that suits your diet so much. And now you have to worry about someone else's diet. And it's just another layer of, of difficulty being a new mom, I think. Um just taking your care of yourself with a vestibular disorder is hard. And then you just add in another layer to it, but it is doable. I mean, somehow I'm surviving. So I don't want to scare anyone off from that. I mean, we've had, I think more issues than the normal person with the lip and tongue tie. And then also with the reflux and he was having trouble with weight gain. And so I think that was from our feeding issues. So it was just initially a lot, but we're slowly chipping away at it. And like I said, it's just like getting over or not really over, but overcoming a vestibular disorder. You just have to chip away at, at a little bit every day. And somehow weeks go by and you're like, oh, hey, this is getting a little bit better. It's the same thing with the baby. <laughs> I would definitely say you're not scaring anybody away. If anything, you're definitely more reassuring. You know, vestibular dysfunction is very prevalent, but to say that they it's very prevalent before you start having children is maybe not as common. And I don't think there, there's not as many people out there that can give the advice that you just gave us, you know, in the short amount of time that is extremely, extremely helpful. You know, a lot of people will get vestibular migraines at the onset of a pregnancy and they are trying to figure all that out yeah. while pregnant and having to give birth and, and figure that new normal out. But the fact that you continuously pave out a wonderful roadmap of great advice and tips for, for patients kind of going through this is amazing. And I think that everything you talked about this, this, uh, for this episode was just spot on stuff that I had questions about and stuff that I can now yeah. bring back to my patients. Um, so one, one of the reasons why I love doing this podcast is we always learn something new, right, Abby? <laughs> <laughs> Always. That's so important as a clinician to constantly learn, of course. Speaking of work-related things, I wanted to ask you, Alicia, how have you handled work? Did you take a, a did you actually take time <laughs> off? I mean, I've seen Instagram posts, so technically that is work for you, but I'm interested to see how you adjusted work, life, baby. What did your balance look like or what does it look like? <laughs> no. It's no balance. <laughs> um, everyone tells me it gets easier. I, I have really struggled with this because I am so work and career driven and it's really been difficult for me. I know some people just have these dreams of being a stay at home mom and, and that's so wonderful. Like my mother-in-law was like the best stay at home mom and her, the kids loved her and everything like that. But that was never me. Like I, I just never I, I wanted to be a mom but I also like having the dizzy cook and being able to answer people's messages and everything so I really had to learn boundaries because I used to spend hours of my day just responding to messages and emails and and th posts in my group and now I just don't have the time for that so I've um brought on a few people to help me with those kind of things, the friends that I really trust. And then I'm also kind of looking into potentially bringing on an assistant who can help me just with like the day to day stuff. So I do have more time to answer questions. But it's been an adjustment just from having all this time to cook whenever I wanted cook whatever I wanted to having someone who you have to feed every two hours and it's this whole process of diapering and then feeding and then trying to get them to go to sleep and it's 
then it starts all over again. <laughs> and you're like, I just said this. <laughs> um, <laughs> but it's do I think it's doable if you just create more boundaries. And that's what I'm learning is that I have to say no to things that don't aren't serving me in the right way. Or if I don't get back to emails right away, you know, it's, it's okay. It'll be there if it's something I really meant to work on and just kind of prioritizing what is really important to me and what can wait. And so I definitely don't have it down yet. If I figure out the secret sauce, I know, <laughs> but you know, that's why they have in Europe, you get like a year of maternity leave. I mean, it's only been two months and I'm getting emails like, hey, I know you're on maternity leave, but you know, and it's, it, we have such a hard time respecting that in the US, I think. And mm -hmm. so that's kind of where you have to set those boundaries because no one else is going to do it for you. And so that's kind of where I'm struggling is, is setting those up and realizing like it's I have to do it. So yeah, <laughs> it's a work in progress. <laughs> That's great advice though. I mean, even outside of new momhood and new baby, I think setting boundaries, especially in the vestibular world is so important, but even outside of the vestibular world, I feel like so many things that we talk about are, are relatable. Even if you don't have a vestibular disorder or symptoms, setting boundaries. That's something we can all work on. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something I've always struggled with my whole life. And, you know, it's, it's just kind of letting go of, of certain things. And the good news is I care. I used to every once in a while, I'll get some, you know, some not so great messages from people or people who want to put you down. And now I just don't care. I'm like, I don't, I don't have time for this. Like, delete. <laughs> like, <laughs> Black. Before I used to like, just do over it for days or things that people would say to me. And I used to get all upset. And I'm just like, okay, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> That's also another good piece of life advice, everyone. She just dropped a gem on us. Delete. <laughs> don't care. See you later. Black. <laughs> what is it? I the sweet girls that are helping me with the Facebook group that I run just to kind of help. Um, I ended up closing it down to people who have the cookbook just because I was getting a lot of the same messages. And I'm like, oh gosh, if you just get the cookbook, it answers all your questions and it would save me a ton of time. So that was one of my boundaries for right now. But some of the sweet ladies here are helping me with the, with the group. They have this phrase called bless and release. <laughs> and so, and, he's, and I love it. I have it on my computer now. And just any time that I'm feeling either run down or someone says something that's not so nice to me, I just say bless and release. <laughs> so you just give them a blessing and release them. <laughs> I love I that. Like that. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> it really I does help. will be using that, I think. Bless and release. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, it's so usually good to they hear. don't come back. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. No, it's it's yeah. so good to hear how everything is going. And although it is a new adjustment period, all of the advice that you gave us today was just fantastic. I mean, from good. prepping, going through everything, and now like life afterwards, it's just, it's. I think it's going to help a lot of people. So thank you. Thank you for yeah. coming on again and doing a part two with us. Oh, of course. I mean, I, I just, I remember being so scared down this journey and I just decided that I wasn't going to let having a vestibular disorder rule my life. Like I was still going to do the things that I wanted to do. And that was via mom. Um, I didn't know that I would have so many challenges with it as far as infertility thing, but I think everyone with a vestibular disorder kind of wonders like, could I handle this? And I just would say, like, before you do it, make sure you have a good team, make sure you have a neurologist you trust, or, or a physical therapist, or whoever you're working with, just make sure you're surrounded by people who can support you. And if you have that, then you are set, like you can get through this, you will have, there will be bumps along the way, but it's not impossible. And if you have a good support system, they will help you get through every challenge that comes your way. 
And I thought I would have be dealing with more dizziness and, and symptoms and everything post birth, especially some of the messages you read in these groups and everything. But I think because I was so prepared for it, it, it just made such a difference in my recovery. So that's just what I would recommend is just you know, prepare all that you can and find to find a good support system. Yeah, that's also a really good point. And another thing that can hold true even outside of pregnancy and new momhood, the support system is so key in the vestibular world. I also just want to personally thank you for joining us and say yeah, to you sorry. that it speaks so much to your character that you are on maternity leave, you are a new mom, and here you are wanting to share your knowledge, share your experience so you can help others. And people like you are special, so. Oh, thank you guys. I only do these things for people I really love. So. <laughs> oh, we well, have, appreciate it. So that's, a, that's a good compliment to you both and everything <laughs> you guys are doing with Talk Dizzy. <laughs> Thank well, you. Thank Do you. you. Make sure. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, everyone that's listening, make sure you check out the Dizzy Cook. Check out all Alicia's things. Buy her cookbook. It's amazing. We cook from <laughs> it all you. the time. Um, so make sure you check that out. I'll, I'll put everything in the show notes like we usually do to make sure they can find you easily. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you, guys. That's exactly what I was getting at. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for listening. Take care. If you're interested in finding us on social media or the web, you can visit www.vestibular.today for more resources, including testing, treatment, and educational videos, blogs, continuing education classes, and resources including clinic equipment recommendations, suggested tests, and BPBB treatment charts. Search Vestibular Today and Balancing Neck Rehab on all social media platforms, including Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Also, be sure to check out Balancing Act Rehab at www.balancingactrehab.com, especially if you think you would benefit from vestibular therapy. We are your girls. The information on this podcast is not intended to replace the care provided by your qualified health professional or to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on Talk Dizzy to Me. Please contact us at Balancing Act Rehab if you think you could benefit from vestibular therapy.